Good morning. Welcome to this Grace Congregational Church, Farmington, Connecticut online service. If we come to worship, focusing on our needs, we will go away feeling let down. If we come to worship, wanting God to respond to our wants and desires, we will leave disappointed. If we come set in our ways, we will leave as barren as when we arrived. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship Almighty God. Our call to worship will be Psalm 13, so turn to the 13th Psalm in your Bible or in your bulletin so that you can read along. I'll read from the New International Version. The title of my sermon is The Lord Will Provide. Let's turn to our call to worship, Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for God has been good to me. Let us pray. We acknowledge you, O God, the creator and sustainer of all life, the author and perfecter of our faith, we join our hearts and minds and voices together to offer you praise and honor for your great glory. As we worship you, O God, may our lives be transformed by the light and life of Christ and renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Gracious and merciful God, we confess that we limit the power of your love and life in our lives because we sin against you and against our fellow human beings. Forgive us, Lord. We confess we fail to look and see people's pain and problems and doubt our ability to make a difference. Forgive us, O oh God. We confess that our conduct betrays the values of the gospel that we believe. Forgive us, Lord. Hear us now as we lift our personal confessions in silence. People of God, hear and receive the good news. You have been brought from death to life because you are not under law but under grace through the free gift of eternal life. Jesus died and rose from the grave. Therefore, we are forgiven. Rejoice, people of God, and let us join in our voices, join our voices together in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes from Genesis 22, beginning at the first verse. Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early in the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham! Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his, own, his son. So Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. From Paul's letter to the Romans, 6th chapter beginning at the 12th verse. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of, the, of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to every increasing wickedness so now offer them to in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? 
Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. From the Gospel of Matthew. <clears throat> he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing and understanding of God's holy word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> has the Lord provided for you, for your family? Have you been healed of some illness, survived an accident, received financial resources you weren't expecting at just the right time? Has God turned a difficult, demanding, or sorrowful time into a time of peace, contentment, or even joy? God provided all those things. Yes, through doctors and medicines, perhaps through angels or unknown sources. But make no mistake, God has provided all the blessings in your life. That's why the Apostle Paul could say, therefore, do not let sin reign in your bo mortal body so that you obey its evil desires, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. We learn the lessons our readings teach us that the Lord will provide when, like Abraham, we obey God and offer to God what is most dear to us. When we are, in Paul's words, slaves to obedience, which leads to righteousness. The righteousness is not ours, but what God has provided in Jesus' death on the cross. The account of God testing Abraham saying, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. It causes us great angst. We wonder how God could tell Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. But we must remember as the prophet Isaiah said, God's thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are our ways God's ways. Genesis tells us God tested Abraham to determine whether Abraham would trust God enough to obey God. In fact, Abraham said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham expected to return with Isaac. Therefore, Abraham bound his son Isaac 
and laid him on the altar on top of the wood, and then took the knife to slay his son. But God stopped Abraham. God did not want Abraham to kill Isaac as a sacrifice to God, proved when God said, now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. God wants us not to hold on to the things, the people, and the blessings that God has given us in our lives. God wants us to put God first, above every other love. Satan tempts us to fail. God tests us that we might succeed, prove, evaluate, measure, and assess our faithfulness. As a biology teacher many years ago, I gave tests regularly. I wasn't trying to trick my students. Honestly, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to trap them. I needed to determine how much of the information I had taught that my students had absorbed. God needed to determine how much Abraham trusted God. How much do we trust God? Like Abraham, enough to obey God? Enough not to sin? Most children are inquisitive, some more than others. Abraham told his servants to remain where they were with the donkey while he and Isaac went on farther to worship. Surely, Isaac had worshipped at other times with his father. As Abraham walked away from the servants with the wood on Isaac's shoulder and the fire and the knife in Abraham's hands, Isaac spoke up and said to Abraham, Father, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham believed God would provide. So Abraham trusted God and obeyed. 15th century monk Thomas Akempis once said, instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Whoever strives to withdraw from obedience withdraws from grace. Abraham proved obedient to the ultimate, giving back to God the very son God promised Abraham. In a sense, that is what parents do at baptism. They give their children symbolically back to God. The author to the Hebrews explained Abraham's willingness to obey this way. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, Abraham did receive Isaac back from death. When the angel of the Lord called Abraham's name and told him not to do anything to the child, Abraham looked up, and there, in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. Abraham expected God to provide, and the Lord did provide all that Abraham needed to worship God. Abraham believed that God was faithful, and as a result, Abraham acted on his faith, and God provided the ram for the sacrifice. Faith and obedience 
go together in the same way as spools of thread are intertwined to form a piece of fabric. The person that obeys God trusts God. The one that trusts God obeys God. When we believe God's word, when we trust God's promises and act on that trust in obedience, the Lord will provide. In 1985, my sister Pam and my nephew Scott and I traveled to Israel. When we visited the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim mosque built on the original site of the Jewish temple, we saw the rock, Mount Moriah as it is called, believed to be where Abraham obediently offered Isaac to God and where God provided the ram for the sacrifice. This is the same place where Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem and where Calvary was positioned. In the very spot where God provided when Abraham obeyed, God again provided Jesus, the Son of God, to willingly die and pay the price for our redemption. Trusting God leads to our obedience, and our obedience leads to God's provision. When we feel as though God has not provided, we need to ask, how much are we trusting God? How obediently are we living? A young woman brought her fiancé home for dinner and to meet her parents. After dinner, her mother told the fa her father to find out about the young man. The father invited the fiancé into his study to talk. The father asked the young man, so what are your plans? I'm a Bible student, the young man replied. A Bible student? Hmm. Admirable. But what will you do to provide a nice house for my daughter to live in. I will study, the young man replied, and God will provide for us. And how will you buy her a beautiful engagement ring such as she deserves, asked the father. I will concentrate on my studies, the young man replied. God will provide for us. And children, asked the father, how will you support your children? Don't worry, sir. The Lord will provide, the fiancé replied. The conversation continued to proceed like this, and each time the father questioned him, the young idealist, idealist insisted that God would provide. Later, after the couple left, the mother asked, How did it go, honey? The father answered, he has no job, no plans, and he thinks I'm God. The Apostle Paul also talked about obedience to the Roman Christians, asking, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey them as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Paul made the connection that no matter how they lived their lives, they were slaves to the one they served, whether to obedience or disobedience. Paul praised the Romans because they had turned their lives around and encouraged, Paul encouraged the Roman Christians to continue to turn from sin that had filled their lives in the past and live lives of righteousness because you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness through following Christ. Paul wrote, now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, in other words, obedient to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord will provide when we live in the light of Christ's teaching, his example, and his call. George Benjamin Clemenceau, the French statesman, physician, and journalist, twice who served as Prime Minister of France, once during World War I, was one of the major voices behind the Treaty of Versailles. It ended that war and said liberty is the right to discipline ourselves in order not to be disciplined by others. In what areas of our lives do we need liberty, the right to discipline ourselves in order not to be disciplined by others, especially by God? In our current social unrest, we need to remember and heed Clemenceau's words. As Christians, we claim the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who set us free from sin and death. Therefore, we should live in that freedom, the freedom that comes when we believe, trust, and obey. When I was in high school, my parents never gave me a specific curfew. I knew when I should be home, and I got home on time. Because I obeyed, at least in that area, I lived in the freedom of no set curfew. My obedience resulted in freedom. How do we live the Christian life so the Lord will provide? In his book, The City of God, written in the early 5th century, St. Augustine dealt with issues concerning God, martyrdom, the Jews, and Christianity's relationship with competing religions and philosophies. He wrote, whatever injury wicked men in power inflict upon good men is to be regarded as a test for the good man's virtues. Thus, a good man, though a slave, is free, but a wicked man, though a king, is a slave. For a wicked man serves not just one master, but what's worse, as many masters as he has vices. For it is in reference to vice that the Holy Scriptures say, by whom, for by whom a man is overcome, of the same also he is a slave. A more modern tr translation says, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. By what, by whom are we overcome? What has mastered us? May we be overcome and mastered by Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. In the late summer of 1989, two million people in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia linked arms and formed a human chain that was 419 miles long. They did it to demand independence from the Soviet Union. When the chain was completed, one word was passed along the line. Each person spoke to the next until that one word had been passed along all 419 miles. The word was freedom. When our Lord Jesus Christ cried from the cross, it is finished. He might well have said, freedom. Our freedom from sin, from violence, from anger, from hatred, from envy. Our freedom from selfish desires, our freedom from death and the grave were all one on the cross 
and celebrated in the resurrection. What do we need the Lord to provide? We know the Lord will provide because God provided Abraham with the sacrificial ram at Mount Moriah. God provided the sacrificial lamb, his own son, at Calvary. God does and will continue to provide whatever we need to draw closer to God and live in the light of his word and righteousness. Like Abraham, let us look up and see God's provision in our lives, in our nation, in our church. Like Abraham and like the Roman Christians, Paul encouraged, let us now that we have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, reap the benefit which leads to holiness and results in eternal life. Not just when we die, but here and now, this afternoon, tomorrow, and the day after, let us offer ourselves to God and see the ways the Lord will provide for us as individuals, as Grace Congregational Church, and as a nation. Amen. Let us come to God in prayer. <clears throat> Providing God, we come to you in prayer for our world. Bring an end to hatred, an end to violence, and an end to our warring ways. Strengthen peacekeepers, peacemakers, and all who work for justice and peace in our world. Touch the hearts of every world leader with the light and life of Christ, that all people might live in peace. May all the nations of the world come to know and understand that we are stewards of the earth's beauty and bountiful blessings. Make us all aware of your glory revealed in all of creation. Heal the people throughout the world stricken with COVID-19. Protect our world from our self-serving natures. Providing God, we come to you in prayer for our nation. Bring an end to hatred, and an end to violence, and an end to injustice throughout our land. Bring calm and peacefulness to every protest, so that all people might live in safety and security. Work in the hearts of every elected and appointed official that our government might serve the people and not political interest groups or corporations or their desire to be reelected. May our government leaders gain the wisdom and insight to work together to bring about the changes that will bring harmony and cooperation among individuals and groups that seemingly have different interests. Heal those newly infected with COVID-19 and protect every part of our country reopening during this trying time. Protect those areas which are hotspots. May those hotspots not spread beyond what can be controlled. Comfort the families who have lost loved ones to COVID-19 and other ailments, unable to grieve with family and friends because of this pandemic. Give wisdom to President Trump, Vice President Pence, all 100 senators and 435 representatives. May they all cooperate and collaborate together that all people might benefit from their service. Protect the men and women serving this country here and overseas. Providing God, we come to you in prayer for our neighbors near and far, those in need. Bring an end to hunger and homelessness, an end to the maladies of our inner cities, rural communities, and every suburb throughout this land. 
Comfort the sick, the sorrowing, the grieving, and the dying. Give hope to the disheartened, the disappointed, and the depressed. Heal every heart wounded by abuse, neglect, abandonment, accident, or ill intention, or injustice. Providing God, we come to you in prayer for your church and Grace Church. Make your church ashamed of nothing except our own sin and afraid of nothing except the temptation to turn aside from easier paths. Make us ready to receive and respond to your call in our lives that we might be faithful in all things. When you call us into faith and service, Lord, may we hear and answer your call and may Christ live in the love you give us to share with others. May all who call Grace Church their spiritual home increase their faithfulness and loving ways that others might see our good deeds and praise you, our Heavenly Father. Providing God, we come to you in prayer for our extended family of faith. Support our couples, individuals, families, those we care about who are struggling or just trying to move forward, those we love facing life-threatening illnesses and those grieving the loss of loved ones with your love and mercy. May we open ourselves to your power and provision during this pandemic and during these social, the social unrest that rocks our land so that we might come to know you, love you, serve you, trust, and obey you each and every day. You know every name, every heart, and every need. Provide for the needs of those we love. Hear us now as we lift the silent prayers we hold in our hearts to your throne of grace. Thank you that you hear our prayers, for we have prayed them in the name of our risen and reigning Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And now receive God's benediction. May the welcoming love of God our Heavenly Father embrace and enfold you. May the giving grace and peace of God the Son, Jesus Christ our Savior, satisfy and fill you. And may the renewing power of God the Holy Spirit, our comforter and daily provider, refresh and sustain you this day and always. Let us go forth to love and serve God as we love and serve one another. Amen. Have a good week. See you next week. God bless.